Yama all and happy last day of LDI. My name is Abby Wright and I'm a proud Gomery woman who grew up on Wiradjuri country and work as a part of the Career Trackers high school team. Before we get started today, I'd like to acknowledge the Awabakal and Waramai people of the Awabakal Nation as the traditional custodians of the country from which I'm joining this session from. As we're jumping on from all different nations, I would like to extend my respect to Elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today. I would also like to appreciate our people's continuously connection to the land and waters and acknowledge that this is and always will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. I just want to run through one of the items in your LDI pack. You will notice that there is a card in there that encourages you to express gratitude to those that have supported you. The card directs you to a link where you can send an e-thank you card. If you're not too sure of your recipient's email address, just pop your advisor down and we can forward them across. It's really important to show thanks and gratitude. So this is a really great exercise to send that good energy to someone who's made an impact in your journey. Reach out to your advisor if you have any questions. And for this afternoon session, still join via the current link. Once you head in, it will then say Big Buzz and you can jump on for the interactive game. Bring your bucket hat and message stick for an extra deadly vibe. So to begin our last day of LDI, we are super blessed to be joined by the incredible Jack Buxcombe who will be running the next session on connecting to country and culture. Jack is a proud Ghana and Naranga man from Tardenya who has dedicated the last 15 years of his life to learning, teaching and revitalising the Ghana language. He is the most fluent Ghana speaker in Australia and believes language is a pathway to reconnecting with country and culture. Jack is committed to sharing cultural knowledge with the next generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and contributes to reconciliation more broadly through Ghana from Kumakuru. This is where he specialises in cultural services, dance, ceremonies, training and workshops that celebrate Ghana culture. Jack has been instrumental in ensuring the continuation and appreciation of Ghana culture in South Australia, and his contributions will be recognised for generations to come. I'm very excited to hand the virtual microphone over to Jack. Thanks, Abby. Uh, now, Marnie, how are we all? Um, look, firstly, I'm just going to have a chat, uh, really just tell you my journey in language learning, cultural revitalisation, um, cultural maintenance, uh, where I'm at, what it took for me to get here, um, and really just uh, hopefully I can help inspire a couple of other people to, to start their journey and whatever they may do as well. Um, I guess where it all started for me, I, I remember growing up as a kid, uh, I was pretty lucky to grow up in, uh, in a family that were very, very connected. Um, a lot of our uh, women in my family were involved in um, the establishment of Aboriginal education here in South Australia. Uh, so they were influential in making sure that education was a, was something that was not going to, I guess, slide. Um, I've got a, two, two older sisters, uh, one, six, seven, one six years older, one seven years older. Um, they both uh, dropped out of school in year 10 uh, because I'm the youngest. My mum forced me to go through. I, I remember I, I did want to drop out in year 10 as well and go be a house painter. Um, I'm glad my mum forced me to go through. Um, she then said that I was going to go to university. And what my mum didn't realise is I struggled to read and write um, and I barely got through school. So... I had certain strengths in school, but there was, uh, I guess, the academic side was not the best. Um, when I when I got a little bit older and I I, I got to sort of year twelve, um, my I realised I only had one year left, and um, I thought I'd try my best to to get through. Um, I did. I chose the uh, the vet line in in school, so I didn't have to. Um, I didn't go for an ATAR score to go to university. Uh, that was a personal choice I made in year 10. 
um, and something that my mum was totally unaware of. Um, she'd never had kids get to the senior school, so she had no idea what to expect. So I chose the vet line and I did horticulture in school because I was, uh, my mum's got uh, four, four, older, four older sisters and I was constantly going to their house and landscaping and cleaning up their yards um, all for and making them cup of teas and all that kind of stuff. So um, while I was doing that, I remember them sitting around the table and they were always talking about um, cultural heritage and native title and things like that. And as a kid, you, you walk in, you walk out. It's the, the last thing that you want to sort of take on board. Um, and while that was happening, uh, I didn't realize what cultural information I was actually taking on board uh, as a kid because I assumed that everybody had the opportunity to learn about or or grew up a lot like us. Um, my dad's Italian Scottish, um, but I only grew up with my mum's side. So for me, um, you know, culture and access to culture from a young age was was always there. Uh, what we we didn't get to speak fluent language uh we just spoke you know aboriginal english um and, and i was teaching my non-aboriginal mates at school and realized that they didn't know and i was i was teaching them at the same time so i guess for me when i got to and the reason why i chose the vet line is because uh i wanted to get as far away from education because if it wasn't talking about cultural heritage and native title around the kitchen table they were talking about implementing education and the importance of it for Aboriginal people. So I was like, I'm getting as far away from education as I can. Um, so when I got to year 12, I got a, an opportunity to do some work experience on a golf course. And, and I was sort of self-taught from about seven years old because we lived across the road from a, um, from a golf course. And for me, um, for two weeks, I just raked bunkers and pulled weeds. And that was something I was used to doing with my, with my mum's sisters anyway. Uh, and the guy asked if I wanted a job. Um, so I had two weeks left of school. I said, let me finish two weeks of the school and, uh, and I'll take that job. And I started on the golf course and I remember the guy cutting greens, um, on the right on lawnmower and I just got my license and <laughs> oops, sorry, that's my door slamming. Um, that was that was cool because uh, he goes, I'll see you in about an hour. Um, it's going to take you that long to cut all the greens. So I turned the first corner and started doing burnouts on this rod on lawnmower. I thought that was a, I thought that was great, but I realized that I wasn't talking to anybody. It was a, a job that you was just you do and you do alone. Um, so I signed myself up to university. Um, I, well, I did an adult re-entry program and a test to, to try and get in. Um, and that, um, I ended up getting in and the teachers, the, the academic advisors asked what I wanted to do. And I said, I'm going to be a lawyer. And they said, you really want to be a lawyer? I said, no, nah, not really. I just want the pay package of a lawyer. Um, so for me, uh, I, after a few questions, they realized that I didn't like to be told what to do. So they got me into management and I loved um, Aboriginal politics as well. So because of the, the old heritage and native title background with the family, it was uh, sort of, I guess, always there. So I did a double degree, lasted about six months. And then I found out that my, my middle sister had passed away. So the one six years older than me had passed away uh, when I came home from university. And that one hit me really hard because uh, we were very much alike um that i was playing footy at um sanfl um the year that the grade just before afl um sort of footy was my life um i gave up that i gave up university i gave up my job um and i, I sort of had depression and stuff at that stage so it took me a while and at the funeral my uncle and a cousin came up to me and he said, Jack, you, you got to build up your identity. You got to build up your strength. You got to build up your spirit. You're flat. So I, um, and he goes, you're going to come and dance with us. 
And I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. No, no worries. I'd love to dance with you. And I never got a chance to dance as a kid. Uh, but it was one of those moments where you're like smile and wave and just agree, but assume like you're never actually going to catch up and do it. Uh, and a week later, he rang me up on my phone. He said, Jack, what are you doing? I said, oh, just at home. He goes, how long does it take for you to get to the city? I said, half an hour. He goes, all right, I'll see you in 35 minutes. Hangs the phone up. And then I had no choice but to go to the city. And as I rocked up, there was uh, uh, this film crew everywhere. And I was like, what are we doing? He goes, oh, you're going to dance with us today and we're going to dance in a Bollywood film. We're just going to be like background in this Bollywood film. I was like, oh, no pressure. Uh, so we go downstairs and he shows me some of the moves. He goes, don't worry, you'll, you'll be lucky to see about a second of it. So I go downstairs, I learn some moves, uh, I get painted up for the first time. And when I looked at myself in the mirror, I went from like Clark Kent to Superman straight away. I was like, look at this power. And um, so uh, we, we had a bit of fun when we was doing it. I remember just uh, joking, uh, doing some muck around dances uh, in the meantime. And uh, that those muck around dances, he, they were actually recording it. And uh, it was the only part that made the film. So um, if you want to check it out, it's Love Story 2050 and there's like four parts to it. And I think it's in part three, um, but you can check that out in your own time. It was the very first time I ever danced and had no idea what I was doing. But what that did was it created like a hook for me. It was like an opportunity for me to go, all right, this is what you don't know. And this is like, it was a passion. I, I really enjoyed it. I go, let's, let's start to learn and learn properly. So I started hanging around my uncle and my cousin like nearly every weekend and uh, he just sitting down telling stories about country and, and the importance of culture and, and why he does what he does. Uh, he's traveled the world, very respect, respected man here in South Australia um, and throughout Australia, actually. And I said, I'd love to be like this guy. He is uh, one of the most amazing people ever. And my cousin, his son, um, was, you know, constantly telling me his story and how he got involved and as was constantly, um, you know, really just giving me a bit of a drive and a push forward. So I, I'm, you know, for where I am now, I'm thankful to them too, because they started my whole journey and, uh, it was sitting there one night and one, and my uncle goes, why don't you come and learn some language with us? It's, uh, we do it around the corner here at Marion and. And I live about an hour from Marion. And I said, yeah, all right, I'll come down and have a look and see what it's like. He goes, it's Garner um, of Adelaide. And, you know, it's a lot like Narunga. Um, and I grew up identifying as a Narunga kid because that's where the mission is. And that's where our family was was taken to. Uh, I had no idea I had Garner connection. So I thought, I'll go and learn because it's the local language. He was really big on me. Like, wherever you go, you speak the local language to show respect. So I, I went to a, to a couple of classes and I remember my first class, this non-Aboriginal teacher, uh, he's our linguist, Dr. Rob Amory, was just rattling off language and rattling off Garner like I'd never heard before. And, you know, it sounded like white noise. It was like, blah, 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 gumbel. and gumbel means to urinate. So I was like, I know that word. My eyes lit up. And, and I said, and he looked at me and he goes, you heard gumbel, didn't you? I said, yeah. I said, I want to learn this sentence. So I spent the next hour learning this one sentence, drove home and just go, mum, look at this. And just rattled this sentence. As, oh, I can't even remember what it, uh, remember what it was now. And uh, my mum was like, oh yeah, okay. Um, so I was like, as soon as she like looked at me, it was like, I just rattled it off. Daddy, anyway, I was like fluent, I'm, I'm good. So like it started my journey on language. I started wanting again, like the dance, it was like a hook and it made me realize what I didn't know, what I need to know um, as an Aboriginal person. You know, we talk about significance of language and culture, and it's our duty to, to, to start that process and journey ourselves because nobody, nobody's really going to give it to you on a silver platter and go, oh, I'm here, here you go. you're a fluent language speaker now, and, and here you know everything about culture. So I, I spent a long, a long time um teaching myself language at home so the linguist taught us all the rules and i'd go home and i'd play with all these different word endings i'd learn i'd look at sentence structures i'd start structuring my own words and sentences um and just had i just had fun with language and and trying to memorize as many words as i could and we had this 
terrible dictionary that you could never find a word. It was never in language, English to language and language to English. It was in categories. So if you didn't even know what the category was, you couldn't find the word. So I just, I'd, I'd just look at pages every night. And before you know it, I started memorizing all of these words. And I go to class, you go, what's the word for a shark? And I'd just go, oh, it's Nakudla. And he go, yeah. And I was like, oh, it's actually paying those looking through those word lists or it is actually paying attention uh, and sinking in here somewhere. So I started going more often. And because I started picking up a whole bunch of language, they said, uh, we got, we got offered a, um, a position at a, a local high school, at Adelaide high school. And it was to a whole bunch of year eight kids. They said, Jack, go and teach them some language. And it was co-facilitated with a, with a regular teacher. And I'd, realize that how difficult late uh, year eight students are at that point in time so i uh, i lasted a year and then i went back to ghana plains aboriginal school and i started working with some reception kids to year sevens um and i was across the whole primary school that then i later moved into the high school as well within the next year so i started learning language from the the bottom and up and then within that next year, our, li our linguist, uh, his father had passed away. So he needed somebody to run his adult class after hours um, for four to five weeks. So I end up teaching adults um, what I was learning and what I knew of language. And then started just getting into more schools. And uh, I started teaching language more over, uh, like in different areas. And then through teaching language, I was learning language. Um, and the, the interesting and the best part about that through learning language, uh, one of our elders got sick and had to go and present a paper in uh, Malaysia um, about our journey with language and cultural revitalization, which we've been doing for 30 plus years now. Um, and they asked if I wanted to go. So I'd, I was a kid and never been outside of South Australia. Um, for and my first trip overseas was to Malaysia and that that was pretty cool because it was all paid for and and I got to see a different part of the world um and each year from there I got opportunities uh to travel to a new place and and go and present about language and culture and and then I started seeing the significance and importance not only that I was playing for you know for myself uh, on a language learning journey and cultural learning journey for myself, what the, the importance that had on my family and the, the importance that had on our community and, and sharing that, that, that journey, I guess, and, and our words was one way to, to acknowledge what I had the opportunity to have. And I've been lucky enough to come in contact with a lot of young people and, and help them on their journey as well. Um, and one of one of the big tips that I always give people is to is to not say no, because when you don't say no and you you actually uh, go and do something, it actually opens doors up for um, for another opportunity. Um, and lucky enough now, like I've I've been doing this uh, for about fifteen years, um, I've I've travelled to nearly every continent except Africa and Antarctica. Um, not sure I'd go to Antarctica too cold, but, uh, I'd definitely like to get to Africa at least, um, to, to tick off all continents. Um, and it's all been through language, teaching language. Uh, I've been lucky enough to, you know, when I was in the United States to, to sit down with some native American people and give them strategies on how to not only just relearn, but how to start embedding language and what you're learning with language into the norm. So Gave, gave them some techniques and strategies in order to embed it. Um, because when I started learning, uh, I had nobody else to speak it to other than our linguist and, and other people like my uncle that, that were learning at the same time. There was, there was no fluent language speakers and we didn't have fluent language speakers for about 80 years. Um, so I would just speak language to my dogs um, and it was all one-way conversations. They didn't judge me. Um, eventually, when I had kids, then I could start speaking language to the kids and get a reaction out of them. Um, and again, no judgment. And eventually, you just you you start to learn more that it just becomes second nature to you start to 
you stop thinking about it as much and thinking of words and you just start doing it, it starts to become natural but you have to spend a lot of time in order to do it so i spent about 10 years probably learning the craft and i'll prove it to, to be where i'm at now um i had to give up a lot of time away from um what other people were doing my age you know going out partying and and all that kind of stuff so uh, for me to to be here and and to be able to teach language and culture um one thing is it's teaching language is one thing that was a journey itself but I, i'm constantly still learning culture still sitting down with old people and they teach me how to uh you know make spears and boomerangs and and coolermans and shields um and and the things that i can do at home when i'm around nobody else i don't need uh other people around to speak language to um you know language is a communication thing so you need others but the cultural maintenance and understanding protocols and processes and those conversations that you learn from your elders uh once you once you go away in comfort of your own home you can start to really you know let it sink into your uh your daily life uh and when you're sitting back making boomerangs and clubs and um shields and you know or you know weaving and all those kind of things you start you know culture starts to play on your mind a lot more as well so and then because it's playing on your mind the next opportunity you get to sit down with old people you get to ask them more questions and you know whether they tell you or they don't because we all know aboriginal people love to talk in riddles and especially elders um they'll be, they'll come a time where they that question that you had uh will be answered it might not be answered in that day but it might be a you know a week later or a month later or even a year or two later um but they see if they see the interest in what you're wanting to understand and what and what you're wanting to take on board they'll provide you with all that information that you need as well so i'm pretty pretty lucky that you know through through language and culture been recognized and been able to one uh travel around south australia sharing and helping other aboriginal languages with their journeys um been around the world helping other indigenous languages and endangered languages uh be able to um i guess share our journey give them some shortcuts because we went the long way around because there was nobody doing it when we started that we've sort of become a um i guess one on the forefront to to be able to go through and do all the uh all the trial and error uh, and give people the things that work and what don't work um we spent the last couple of years doing a lot of digital stuff on youtube and um you know social medias and those kind of things because unlike a lot of other countries around the around australia uh within going to country we have over a thousand schools um as a language speaker and a language teacher you're not getting to a thousand schools uh, or coming into contact with a thousand schools within a, a you know within a calendar year or, or even a couple so we had to rely a lot on the digital stuff so we can get the word of language and culture uh out to the mainstream not just the mainstream non-aboriginal people but uh, other aboriginal people that call this place home as well uh we all have multiple connections to to different groups um you know i'm, I'm connected to uh four different groups um i i speak and i teach in ghana but i support the other languages in uh wherever i can and when they when they ask for it as well um but for me i've really taken the opportunity to to continue my own practice um you know it's you know went from like language revitalization to now language maintenance and cultural maintenance and i think that's a duty for all aboriginal people is to realize in yourself that you've got to make that you've got to make that journey happen um and anything that you want to learn it you, you got to start now um you don't want to get to sort of where a lot of our people are now 40 50 60 years old and starting their language journey or, or cultural journey um so lucky enough i started young um i started young enough that in 2011 i was actually recognized as uh, young south australian of the year and i went up for the australian of the year awards um and i didn't end up winning i was up against a, a girl that uh, sailed around the world it was pretty pretty on top of uh, uh the world at that stage uh, so i didn't i didn't win but i was uh, right next to the winner when she got announced so that's my five seconds of fame on, uh, on australia 
on a, a Australian of the Year awards. But for me, um, the recognition uh, from others that my my I started off as my personal journey and how much that has influenced others in our community, not just within Garner country, but within South Australia. Um, when I had my daughter in 2011, in 2012, we um, was asked if they want to shoot a documentary. Uh, that was such an honor um, because it sort of just went through the life of, of Jack and what what, we, what I did on a daily basis and try to portray that and that that got some feedback and that spread around Australia, around the world and 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 others were were doing similar stuff and thought that that was in a in a, um, a they felt like it was very lonely because they were doing it themselves um, and they thought they were the only ones doing it until they watched that video. So you know it helped uh, create an opportunity and a starting point for people to start having those conversations with each other uh, to reach out and realize that there's other people that are doing very similar stuff when it comes to language and culture. And if we, we, we have those discussions in yarn with each other, then we can, I, I guess, support each other in whatever way we can. And, and that's, you know, not just in, not just in Aboriginal people, I guess, supporting Aboriginal people, but it's supporting non-Aboriginal people come on a journey with us. Um, it's supporting other Indigenous people around the world that are doing very much the same stuff that we're doing, that have uh, gone through the same issues and challenges that our people have gone through. Um, and for for me now, like I've, um, I've started my, I, I started when I was dancing with an uncle, uh, I lasted a number of years and when I started my own group uh, back in 2008 it was just nephews um, that I was teaching and now that's grown into you know um, nieces and and other Aboriginal people that never had the opportunity as that, that grew up in this society that spoke Aboriginal English that we all know each other but we they didn't have an opportunity that I had so my uncle that I learned from was really big on if you want to learn and you show the drive to learn, we'll teach you what you want, whether you're Aboriginal or not. So uh, I've taken that on board and I try to continue his legacy with teaching as many people, people as I can and influencing as many people to, to try and close the gap and realize that we're all the same. Um, you know, a lot of us, even us Aboriginal people, we have um, connections to, to non-Aboriginal um, relatives and, and relationships and, and we have connections to other groups. So when we talk about our connection to Aboriginal culture, it's one that it's important to us, the, the maintenance of it, but also we have the other side so we can be empathetic in a way that we, you know, one side of our family sees another, that we can have that opportunity to teach. So I've always found myself, um, I guess, between the two worlds. Uh, I've grown up with a very strong family not just in education, but a lot of our men went and practiced, uh, you know, went back and did law business and culture and things like that, which, you know, when it comes down to cultural protocols, you know, it, they speak a different language than, than Garner, but the cultural protocols are very significant and important for me as a person to realize, understand and maintain and pass on to my children. Um, so like my kids are my main drive on why I do what I do now. It was, uh, I guess it started off as a journey for me to realize that my other, it influenced my family members, it influenced our community, but, you know, with language and cultural revitalization and cultural maintenance, it's, uh, it, it, it will stop with me if, uh, if I don't take that journey on and passing on those knowledges and stories. So. Now uh, I try and give them every opportunity for my kids to to travel out the country. Um, you know, even if we're not traveling out the country, we're sitting in the backyard and we're making tools and weapons. And my my five year old, my seven year old son can sit there with axes and make you know clubs and and clap sticks and and the things that you know a lot of people don't get the opportunity to do. But you know, they're having they're having access to culture. At, at a much younger age and more people are doing it. So that we're the younger generation becoming much more, I guess, culturally competent. Um, and, and to see that 
and you know when you see the old people watch the young people do it like and when you see them watch them dance um they they just look there with awe and 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 respect so for for me i go I, the the uh, my journey's a long way from finished um it's a a journey that i've enjoyed every step of the way there's lots of challenges in in doing in doing what we do um you have to find yourself um in a situation that sometimes that you you can't be biased in certain areas whether it's biased just to aboriginal knowledges and culture um or you know on a political scale you you really got to be there to support anybody that wants to uh, take on that journey for themselves um and you know one thing i found uh difficult was um because my job then became very social um, in performance base and, and service delivery, when when COVID came in for the very first time and and we all went into lockdown, um, I had I'd only just started my own company and started working for myself, and now I've been doing that for three years, but I had to look at other ways that we can start to continue teaching language and culture because everyone's locked up in their houses and people wanted to learn about language and culture. And I think the blessing on, on the very first lockdown is people realize that country, we can get more from country than, um, than we've given ourselves credit for. We got in this, uh, in this process of that where we were just going to, you know, Coles and Woolies and, and everything was economically driven and that you couldn't grow your own stuff and, and knowledges that came with it, the tools and weapons that came with those plants were, being pushed aside that it forced us to uh to all realize that country is the most significant thing that any of us have and you know no language no culture um plays a part and is you know language and culture is is not as significant if you don't have country to to live on to in order to do it so look after our country first and then the yeah, other things come into play as well and uh during that time i was asked uh, by uh nasa uh asked uh for a boomerang uh that an astronaut could take up into space and it had to be a specific length a specific width um and for me that was um i, I jumped at that opportunity um one because uh i was making stuff at home and, and it continues to to make me think of culture when i'm making stuff that um but when i like sent it off and and then thought about it uh when that boomerang comes back i guess that's the i should go on the guinness book of records for the longest flight of a returning boomerang uh in history um and I'll, I'll if not i'll just make myself a plaque and go yeah i got that title um but it's uh, the fun thing about it and when i when i talk to kids i love to joke and i love to have fun with kids i, I love one to teach adults and to really um show them things that they didn't realize that they didn't know but little kids like to have fun so um i'll teach language and culture in a fun way through playing games and when i say i've got a boomerang uh, out of this world they go how far you know they ask silly questions like oh where do you put your boomerang and you're all painted up with no pockets or how far can you throw a boomerang i say yeah I throw one in space um and they don't believe you so um but the, the, what that does is then it starts them having a discussion and having a conversation uh, within their own peer groups at school, at kindergartens. Um, I remember my, my, my son, uh, they had at kindergarten, uh, we, they, they took in Animals Anonymous. So they took in all these like uh, native animals into the school and started talking about them. And they go, oh, they, they had this little kangaroo. And they go, oh yeah, we call this kangaroo. And my son at, this, at that time, he's like four years old. And he goes, he just turns around and goes, is that a boy or a girl? And they'll go, oh, that's a boy. He goes, oh, we call that Nandal. And uh, if it was a girl, that's Wawi. She's got a different name. So kangaroo is not a name for both male and female kangaroo. He starts educating these uh, these experts in in animals, native animals on language and culture and they go oh how do you know this stuff he goes oh my dad taught me yeah we go hunting for them all the time so we shoot them we eat them 
And then the kids were like, you eat kangaroo, like, and you, you shoot kangaroos. So they had a multicultural day and my, my son said, dad, you have to bring some, some kangaroo and some wombat in so the other kids can eat. And it was the first thing that was the first thing gone. Um, and, and every year my, my kids go into uh, new classrooms with new teachers. Uh, they're given an opportunity to teach language and culture to not just the teacher themselves, but to their peers. Um, so, you know, from a young age we're we're getting our voices heard and that's from, you know, starting a journey, you know, for myself, it, it, it's a ripple effect and we all, we all keep on making, uh, um, our marks on, um, you know, not just our own lives, but other people's lives, even if it's the slightest, you know, one, one positive thing leads to the next. And, um, like I said, at the start, when I, when you, when you do a film, for example, and then you start to get the feedback and, and see people that have watched it interstate or, or internationally. Uh, and they, they thought that they was in a, in a journey doing this kind of stuff themselves. And I remember before, before doing that film and getting that feedback, it's very much how I felt doing language and culture, um, and learning for, and, you know, that whole learning process at home, um, by myself was very much like that. So, um, you know, teaching now, I've gone, um, a, a sort of away from the education system. I worked in the education system for about eight years, uh, moved into the vet system and started teaching at, um, at a TAFE level. I uh, started teaching at universities there for a while as well. Um, I still guest lecture at universities, uh, but now I, I run my own company. I teach my own uh, classes and I'm, and I'm actually in the process of doing, a, I, I guess, a bit of an online university um, just in language learning. So um, I'm working at and looking at taking the sort of the knowledges of our people and our culture, the oldest living you know, civilization in the world and bringing it to the 21st century. And we've, we've even had some really cool discussions with some, you know, high tech gurus about, you know, embedding and utilizing artificial intelligence, uh, when it comes down to language and cultural learning and journeys, uh, for others as well, because, you know, for a lot of us in language revitalization, um, you know, it, it is a very lonely journey, um, you know, for, for a lot of those Aboriginal communities that are very strong in language and culture still, um, they, they don't have the, the struggles or the issues uh, that a lot of us have in re, the revitalization of language. So, um, yeah, that's been sort of a, a journey that I've, I've worked towards, um, you know, when I, when I teach language and culture to my kids. Uh, I don't force language on them. Uh, I utilize and encourage language use. I don't force culture on them. I just tell them our stories and our ways because uh, on top of, you know, being Aboriginal, my kids, you know, my dad's side is Italian and Scottish, but so they recognize the non-Aboriginal side um, because they've got family members that are non-Aboriginal and from England, et cetera. Uh, but my kids are Vietnamese as well. So for them to have, you know, connections to all of, you know, for their identity, they need to know more than just Aboriginal language and culture. And, and through traveling the world, I've got a worldview and realized that there's a lot of similarities in culture and language worldwide than we, we actually give ourselves credit for. A lot of people, uh, and what's really focused, what, what a lot of people focus on, I guess, is the differences. Um, if you look at the similarities, there's a lot more similarities than differences. You know, some words will be different, but sentence structures and all this kind of stuff is all very much alike. So, you know, for me to, to learn Garner um, as uh, the first language that I learned, um, it was very easy to then start picking up other languages. When I started learning Pindara, uh, Yankundara from the AP Wildlands, uh, I did a two week summer school and learned everything that I was teaching in two days. Uh, so, you know, what, once you know what to look for, it becomes very easy to start looking at other languages and, and I'm pretty confident you give me a learner's guide and a word list. I could pretty much learn, um, any Aboriginal language, um, because we all have the same structure of language learning. The only thing that's going to be different is different wording. So, um, yeah, I'll have a bit of fun now, not just speaking Garna and, and learning more Garna, but to, uh, and teaching it, but to learn other languages like Pinjara or Yongumata, um, you know, I was trying to use a bit more Naranga from the York Peninsula, 
um, and even my wearing will side as well. We're util utilizing those materials to and, and people to to have conversations and learn more than just one Aboriginal language. So, yeah, I think uh, I think that's about it. I don't know. I'm looking at timing and I go, I don't know how I'm going. So well, I might throw it over to Abby. And what do you reckon, Abby? Is that enough time? I know we're going to have questions. <laughs> Yeah, we definitely have questions coming through. So I'm going to start with our first question, which is from Lily. So my family is not very connected to culture and I would love to form that connection. What steps would you recommend I take to form that connection? Uh, I guess you, you're going to have people in your community. Um, we do a lot of work here. Uh, uh, there's a young fellow that lives here in South Australia who uh, or I remember when I first started working in a school, uh, he was very much disconnected from language and culture. His family is from Brisbane, um, grew up in Adelaide, didn't know what it was like to grow up in a big Aboriginal family because it was just his mum and his nana here, uh, has a non-Aboriginal dad, uh, took him under my wing, got him involved. Uh, you know, he wanted to, he goes, you know, he was getting into trouble and he, and his excuse for getting into trouble was, ah, oh, that's how we that's how we act as Aboriginal. That's what we do. I said, no, it's not. I said, you want to know what it's like to be Aboriginal? Come to my come to my house and come meet our family. And and he realised that my family are really big on you know striving to be bigger and better than um, than a lot of people give uh, or the community like people's perspectives of Aboriginal people in the community. So. You've got people in your community that are connected. Um, it's about sitting down and, and enjoying a learning out. When, uh, uh, when my old people, when we sit down with the old people down here, they would do a point to two ears and one mouth. That means you've got to listen twice as much as you speak. If you're willing to sit down and listen to, to people, then they'll, they'll provide you with the information you need. So you've got people in your community. It's just reaching out to them. Whether they're family or not, they'll take you in. Amazing. Thanks, Jack. Our next question is from Wade Clark. So in relation to your comments on non-Indigenous people learning language, how do you think we can introduce language and culture to the wider Australian audience in a way that invites them instead of overbearing them? Uh, I guess once it's uh, education is the key, once you're embedded into the mainstream education system. So, uh, you know, I know Akara are working on some national documents around Aboriginal uh, languages in, and embedding those into uh, into schools around Australia. Uh, once they start to uh, starts to get embedded, um, you know, there's an opportunity for people to realise that uh, they are invited to to enjoy that journey. Um, those documents are obviously written, so it's not going to help with pronunciation for learners. But again, I guess just like reaching out as an Aboriginal person to your elders, uh, the best way to learn is to sit down and 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 be told information. So um, I, know I was looking at a statistic only a, last year, the year before, that 9% of the Australian population, non-Aboriginal Australians, know an Aboriginal person outside of the workplace. That means you don't know us as friends. Uh, so non-Aboriginal people need to be able to sit down and again, do that too. Awesome. Another question that's come in is, is it inappropriate to learn or speak words from a language when you don't belong to that mob? Nah, see the golden rule is speak the language of the country you're on. Uh, so whatever, whatever language you're speaking, see like if I speak my language on another country and it's happened a lot, um, people come down here and they'll, they'll speak a different language it's actually inappropriate. The word means something different in my language. So speaking your language of my country is is very different. And and I'm sure that when I go to yours and I speak my language, it's going to mean something different. It's going to be inappropriate. So uh, golden rule uh, for all Aboriginal people, you, you speak the language of the country that you're on. Great advice. Um, another question that's come through is, I want to be able to take my brother and myself back to Najuri country for the first time. So do you have any suggestions or resources I can tap into from Anastasia? All right. So with the, with the Najuri mob, they did have a whole bunch of language resources. So uh, you'd have to get in contact with 
uh, Annie Pat Warrior Reed, who uh, she she has control over those language resources. So there's uh, children's children's dictionaries and dictionaries as well. So you, you can start to look at some of the language. It actually is part of the same language family as Garan. It's just spelled a little bit different, uh, and some words uh, are c completely opposite, but it's uh, part of the same language family, so it's very similar. Um, but she has control over those and only allows other Ngadjuri people to, to be able to get their hands, they'll get their hands on their resources. Uh, so Ani, Ani Patwari Reid is, is the, uh, the person in contact uh, there. Uh, the other one is Uncle Quentin Agus, who does a whole bunch of tours and, and knows a lot about the landscape. And uh, he's, uh, I think, um, biggest uh, in South Australian, in Aboriginal South Australian tourism. He's the, the um the peak person you want to be going to he's been doing it for about 10 15 years or probably even longer uh very knowledgeable man that uh you can definitely reach out to and i think he you can have a look in his stuff online i think it's uh ajadura uh, if you look at ajadura.com you should be able to find him as well Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing your contacts, Jack. Anastasia, feel free um, to send me an email or your advisor an email. And if you have any other questions, we can get in contact with Jack. But um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing your contacts. Another question. So this is from Wade. Firstly, my heart goes out to you, brother. When dealing with close kin loss, what advice would you give in finding a way to be able to be productive again after that loss? Yeah, that was that was a difficult time. Um, it hasn't been the first time we've gone through it. As I guess you know, a lot of like an Aboriginal family, you go very connected to a lot of followers. But uh, I, I guess don't don't isolate. Um, COVID gets us isolating enough. Isolation does uh, bad things to us mentally. I think uh, relying on uh, others for that support and using using your support. Um, um, you know mechanisms and, and surroundings those people that are willing to to stand there with you and and to be able to give you a different mindset on different things definitely reach out to those people and and to be able to have those chats even if it's a even if it's a hello how are you um just checking in um and and be that person for others as well when you realize that they're doing it then they're, they're doing it tough so um one just don't get into don't get trapped into the isolation and and excluding yourself um it didn't it didn't work that's something i did um it didn't work and the only way i came out of it is when i surrounded by you know others that were building my i guess my spirit yeah thanks for being so vulnerable and personal um another question which is going to be kind of close to heart but what does it mean to you to be able to speak language Ah, it's, it's it's pretty cool. Like to to be able to go, you know, to speak Aboriginal English, and you go, um, you know, you know, you, we get pride in 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 teaching our non-Aboriginal friends Aboriginal English, um, but it, sometimes we don't even realise that half of what we're saying is English, and they, if they can read between the lines, they understand what you're talking about. So you can never be sly. And as kids, you think that you're being like, oh yeah, these followers won't understand us, but half the come half half the sentence is English, so they'll understand you when. When speaking in language, it's uh, one is the you know a tool that other people can't understand what you're talking about. Uh, me and my daughter do it when we're out in the shops, um, but uh, I guess when when speaking in fluent language, you realise that it's the the language of the place that you're standing on. Language gives you a better insight into culture because the words, the sentences, and how and the 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 view, the Aboriginal view on those words. And how they're how they're said uh, gives you a connection to you know when we talk about that spiritual connection to place language does that it brings brings those thought processes from the spiritual world into your own thoughts so like I said when you're making tools and weapons the spirits are affecting your mindset by influencing what you're thinking about so then you can uh, so language I guess and speaking it is it's about connecting yourself to the bigger picture of humanity and and services that uh, our people have gone through before us. Sweet, thanks so much. Um, that was so empowering, I feel hyped after that response. Um, another question from Samuel Webb. 
So, hey, uncle, I loved the talk in revitalizing language. Where do I start with finding more about my tribe's language and learning it? Um, I, I guess it's looking at who it is first. Um, so once you once you get into that, like if, so for Ghana, we had to rely a lot on the historical written information written from German missionaries. Um, so once we got a lot of that information, then we started, we had to really deconstruct everything that was in, um, that was created to understand it ourselves. And then we started embedding and, and adding to that over the time. So uh, one, find out who the mob is and then to find out if then, you know, start looking at the, you know, libraries and things like that. If you if there's nothing already out that you know of, start looking into state libraries and, uh, his, uh, the history funds and, and agencies because there'll be a whole bunch of journals uh, that were recorded from from uh, settlers that will at least be able to point you in the direction. There might be some recordings. I know other than the German missionaries, there was a local dentist uh, that lived here in Adelaide in 1836 who, you know, was running around as a 10-year-old kid, was told language and he learnt language. And as he got older, he wrote down like about, 30 words I think that he remembered as a kid growing up with other Garner kids so yeah it's just starting that that um that research um it, you know a lot of languages are documented there are, I know there are yeah there are a few in South Australia that were never recorded um for whatever reason but um uh, it'd be unfortunate if there if you haven't had any any documentation of your language and then you just go to your neighboring groups and look at the uh, the ones that you're connected to because even if you speak one mob's language, uh, you're, you're actually part of a language family. Um, you know, when I hear um, the mob, like I, well, when I watch AFL Indigenous Round and, and I hear the mob doing welcome the country over at the MCG, it sounds exactly like Ngarindjeri to me. And it's because they actually are part of the same language family. Ngarindjeri is from the Lower Lakes and Kurong down here. So you know your neighboring groups if they're recorded they're going to be very similar and i'll just i'll just start adapting from their language yeah awesome thanks um we're firing in with the questions so many coming through so we probably have time for a few more what are your thoughts on culture being taught at school all right cool uh Culture is fine to be taught at school, but it's got to be led from Aboriginal people. I'm not, I'm not one on non-Aboriginal people, uh, you know, something they learnt in a book, then to go and start, you know, teaching 20, 30 kids in a school because they get it wrong. Uh, they've influenced, you know, 20, 30 different mindsets and created, you know, th you know th that number of students they've come in contact with uh to to relay wrong information and i remember as a kid growing up that was that was something that happened to me growing up in the in the 90s and my teacher was like oh you know you, you know she was telling all these kids in my class to come and to come and ask my permission to color win color in uh, aboriginal flag um the red part to to use the red pencil they had to come and ask my permission to use the flag and i was like what the hell i had no idea what was going on here and um she goes oh yeah i had to get all the kids to ask you permission to to use the color red because that's what aboriginal people do uh when using red you need to ask an aboriginal person's permission so i've uh i had no idea about that i go home i said mom what's this miss miss wilson told me i needed to uh, uh all these kids i told them what happened and they needed my permission to use the color red. She goes, well, firstly, Jack, you're, you're 10 years old. You're not given permission as a 10 year old kid. And two, it's yellow pencils, uh, red, red pencils. That's, that's got nothing to do with it. Red pencils, red lipsticks. You don't need permission for that. Um, she's like, go speak to your uncles about the cultural element. Um, because you know, there is a cultural element to red and people need to be aware of it. Um, and that was around red ochres. Uh, you're not allowed to use red ochre unless it's through certain times and for certain people. Uh, and when it comes to um, Aboriginal artwork, uh, like a lot of our family are connected to APY lands and uh, art's, gone, art's gone to another level. Um, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of a lot of art these days because if it doesn't have dot paintings, it's not Aboriginal art, which was never the case for us. Um, for those that don't even don't know, 
um, dot paintings uh, come from Central Desert. They're APY, so South Coast, East Coast, Northern Territory, Queen, Queensland. All these all these mobs around the coast. None of us did dot paintings, and you got to be careful when you're doing dot paintings as well. There's certain things that you're not allowed to do with it, and the color red is a part of that as well. But I'll let you follow. Take some take some uh, guidance in your learning from your elders. Yeah, brilliant. Um, another question we have is, what is your advice for learning pronunciation when your language is starting to be revitalized? Are there any resources where language is recorded from Isabella? Yeah, we didn't have anything recorded verbally. It was all written lang. Uh, it was all written language. But there's only there's only uh, two rules in writing language. Uh, a lot of when it comes down to consonant, the, the consonants. So there's a, a lot of languages are either write with a B or a P, a T or a D, or a K or a G. Um, usually there's two columns. Some languages actually have both. Uh, Garna was like that, but they actually the same sound. Once you realise that all Pamanyungan languages, so Pamanyungan languages means every language, every Aboriginal language in Australia except for around the Kimberleys area, uh, all part of Bum and Jungan languages. So we all follow the same rules, which is those, the sound systems are very much alike. And the way that we structure our sentences, which is subject, object, verb, um, we, we all do our language that way. So um, once you learn the pronunciation of one, you can, you can speak any Aboriginal language. So once you learn, once you learn the rules to one, you'll, you'll be able to speak them all. That's sick. Um, great insight. And then we have one last question. So I don't live on the land my mob is from and my workplace is on a whole other mob's land too. My company is national and global. I'm wondering if I'm incorporating language into my work content, what should I use? From Jay. All right. So you don't work on your country and you're living in a different area. That one's hard. Um, I know when I travel and I, when I'm sharing my story my, and I'm speaking in my language, I make it very clear that this is my language and this is the country it comes from. And I try to educate people as well. Uh, if it's going into another Aboriginal land, then I try to acknowledge their language and their people uh, as much as I can in I'll speak in my mother tongue language, but I'll try to incorporate, you know, if it's a greeting or a hello, I'll make contact with traditional owners, try and find that and speak in their language to them on their country. Uh, so to, I guess, to semi answer it, it's, it's really just to uh, stay true to you. If you, if you know your language, then maintain your language. Uh, if you're speaking, if you're on another person's country, you've got to do your duty to acknowledge them by speaking their language and showing as much respect as you can uh, on a company level. Uh, and you're, you have influence in a company on, on a, I guess, a, a national, international, global, uh, company, uh, raising that awareness with them, uh, to say that this is, you know, when you say I speak in this language, one of a thousand languages, you take every opportunity you can to educate and bring them on a journey. So then they realize that, you know, this isn't the language of, of Aboriginal people. It's there's multiple languages and mul it, we're a very, very diverse people. We do have a lot of similarities, but we're, language wise, we're very diverse when it comes to uh, Aboriginal Australia. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jack. It's been um, so incredible having you join us. I'm now going to hand across to Panju. Hey, um, just sorry, small corrections, it's Panju. Um, you know, always get pronunciation right, as Jack was talking about. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you, Jack. It's always good having a yarn with you and hearing your story and what you share. It's really good to hear about what you're doing for, you know, community and language now and kind of given that insight of reconnecting with language, you know, as Aboriginal person, especially like in this modern age, I feel like it's a really strong part that, you know, a lot of people can relate to. So I just want to say uh, thank you from Career Trackers for coming out today. And uh, um, as an appreciation, you'll probably get something in the mail soon from them. And that concludes the session, I'd like to say. Uh, but hold on, I think there's a short video coming. is